Welcome to Film Forum Presents, a podcast featuring special live events recorded at our theater located at 209 West Houston Street in downtown Manhattan. In this episode, Film Forum Presents actor Richard E. Grant, who appeared for a Q&A following a special screening of Bruce Robinson's cult classic 1987 film, With Nail and I which features Grant's astonishing screen debut performance. The Q&A took place on January 31st, 2019, and was moderated by Film Forum's Theater Operations and Events Manager, Joseph Berger. Richard E. Grant is nominated for the 2019 Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for his role in the film, Can You Ever Forgive Me? Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out in the cold. Uh, my name is Mike Majori. I'm a programmer of the premieres here at Film Forum. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this meeting of the Richard E. Grant Appreciation Society. <laughs> As everyone in this room must know, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences has finally nominated Richard E. Grant for an Academy Award for his performance in Can You Ever Forgive Me? <laughs> Directed by Marielle Heller. Uh, the New York Film Critics Circle has also awarded him Best Supporting Actor for this role. If you have not seen the film yet, I highly recommend it. It's still playing in Manhattan. Over 30 years ago, Grant made his film debut in With Nail and I, written and directed by Bruce Robinson, based on Robinson's own experiences in the late 1960s. This is the mother of all British cult films. It's widely quotable. One critic said, every line is a quotable joy. And it's also given birth to a rather unproductive drinking game. Uh, one of the striking things about watching it today is just how fully formed an actor Grant is in this performance. Again, his very first screen role, one he apparently had to fight off fellow British actors Daniel Day-Lewis, Kenneth Branagh, and Bill Nye. Due to rights issues, this film is rarely screened these days, um, at least in the United States, uh, but happily we were able to find this restoration from Arrow Films, uh, who re-released the movie a few years ago, and I want to thank them, as well as Janus Films, and for making the screening possible, and I want to also thank Charlie Olsky and Fox Searchlight for making Grant's presence possible. And I should add the late George Harrison for getting this film made in the first place <laughs> under his production shingle, Handmade Films. Uh, Grant will be right here, joined uh, w by uh, Film Forum's own Joe Berger for a Q&A following the screening. Enjoy, and we'll see you afterwards. Thanks for being here tonight, folks. My name is Joseph Berger. I'm the events manager here at Film Forum. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome our guest, Mr. Richard E. Grant. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to Film Forum. Thank you. For, um, you is this on? Yeah, It's on. We can hear you. You sound great. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming out on this arse-paralyzingly cold night. <laughs> <laughs> so that literally your sphincter goes, Doom! I'm in New York. It's just very bracing. Thank you. Thank you. You flew in from Los Angeles hours ago, and you're flying back hours from now. True. So we, we have, yes. Well, thank you for being here in the cold. Um, and I, 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 I'm not a sycophant. Uh, can you take a compliment? I'll try. Are you one that can take a compliment? I, I watched this yesterday. I watched this just now. And my colleague earlier, when he introduced the film, he talked about how it's rare we see a debut of an actor in a lead role so fully formed. And today oh. I was thinking about Burt Lancaster and the Killers and Eva Marie Saint in On the Waterfront. Wow. And John Malkovich in Places in the Heart. Whoa, okay. And uh, <laughs> Miss Barbara Streisand in Funny Girl. But yes. these are truly... <laughs> Anything for Babs. I think, I, I, I do, I, I think, and I think everyone here can agree, it's fair to say that we could place you in that pantheon of actors oh, based on you. this one film. Thank you. Um, if you hadn't done anything beyond this one film, you'd be fine. Thank you. It would well, be a great legacy. I should, well, thank you very much for blowing so much smoke up my <clears throat> fundament. That's my job. Uh, I have to say that if Sir Daniel Day-Lewis and his three Oscars had not turned this down, I wouldn't be sitting here tonight. So thank you to Daniel, who you've adopted into your city. Congratulations on your Oscar nomination. Thank you. Thank you. And I, have I wake to up every morning and I still go, 
is this still true? And then really? so a friend of mine said that even when Mahershala walks off with you know his 17th Oscar next month, you will still be Academy Award nominee. And I think, fuck, that's worth it in itself. Okay, because my, <laughs> my follow-up question was, do you really give a shit about that? Of course you I do. do. Okay, good. Yeah. And anybody who tells you that they don't, I call them a fucking liar. Okay. Genuinely. Good to know. All right. Yeah. Um, I ha- okay, first of all, out of curiosity, who had never seen that before? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. You, did you enjoy it? Um, Thank you. Secondly, um, if you have not seen Can You Ever Forgive Me, uh, you must. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that before we jump into this. Okay. It's brilliant. I saw it last night. I was weeping through most of it. And Thank it's you. it's interesting. Um, it's so great that we can bookend this evening with your first film and your most recent film because they're essentially the same film in a lot of ways. Okay. Do you disagree? Uh, well, you've got the same actor playing an alcoholic with a 33-year time gap in between but in long coats. It's true. But... Um, I didn't get to stup any boys in the first one. Uh-huh. Um, uh huh. Uh, just saying. Well, and I, I don't mean, think Withner will have cleaned anybody's cat shit up, but I understand where you're coming from. I, I mean, you're, I, you're I, dealing with loneliness and friendship, which are the common denominators in both films. Absolutely, yep. and and alcoholism, which is <laughs> the third character yeah. in both films, and um, failure, we, failure, a kind of a seeking for total abjection. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, absolute self-loathing um, and like making really bad mistakes at yeah. every turn okay mostly fueled by alcohol where are you leading and um, I don't know uh, okay but um, so I guess my question is I know you don't drink and I know that um, alcohol plays a predominant role in many of your uh, roles and your characters so how are you so convincing at being a likable drunk or an unlikable drunk. Oh, well, thank you. Um, my father was an alcoholic. I thought that it was psychosomatic for me because I couldn't keep anything down for more than, I think, 10 minutes is what I managed, or nine minutes without being violently ill for a long time, uh, 24 hours. And so I went to a doctor when I was 17, and I said, is this psychosomatic? And he said, we can only find out by doing a blood test. And he came back with the results and said, you have no enzyme in your system. You can never drink because it's completely toxic to you. Mm-hmm. So and my observation of, of people who are drunk is just this incredible concentration of, I've got to get through that door and that <laughs> slight delay that happens with stuff. And that uh, seems to me what it is. Right. So that's as much as I know. What right. the fuck? Yeah. So you just take an extra beat with every line and you're good. What? You take yeah. an extra beat with every line, and yeah. you're good. And you sort of slightly blur your eyes. I'm giving you my technical secrets here. That's, that's what we want. And that's why we feel here. slightly glazed, and other people th- seem to think you are blathered. So, um, and going back to the fully formed actor straight out the gate, um, you uh, you were born and raised in Swaziland, mm-hmm. smallest country in the southern hemisphere. Smallest country in the su- southern hemisphere. Yeah. Um, and you, you studied acting in Cape so Town? So you repeated that to me because you didn't think that you could understand me. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm just curious. The accent, it's a little tough, Richard. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I d- I'm doing my slower. darndest. Um, I, uh, uh, you studied in Cape Town. I did, yeah. And you, went, you moved to London in the early 80s. Yeah, 1982. Okay, and you landed this role in... Uh, 1986. So what were you when doing? I was 29. What were you doing in between? Were you st- study? Were you acting on stage? Were yeah, you- I I I did uh, the equivalent of your theatre in the park here with Natasha Richardson when she was 21, her first professional job. Um, bless you. And then I was I did an improvised film called Honest, Decent, and True for the BBC with Gary Oldman and an English actor called Aid Edmondson, and was then followed by nine months of unemployment. And I thought, well, I'd have to go back to Swaziland and sell pineapple beer on the corner because I thought I'm fucked. So the day that it screened on a Sunday night on the 13th of January, 1986, the following day I got a new agent who then put me in front of Mary Selway, casting director, who had spent two months after Daniel Dare lewis had turned this down, trying to find an actor that could say the lines and make the director laugh or hear them as he'd heard them in his head. And so Bill Nye had gone, come and gone, Kenneth Branagh come and gone, various other, you know, glitterati of that time and ongoing time. And 
I then came in and read for him and I said two words, fork it, which made him laugh. And at the same time, my script went missiling and my fingers went towards his, I don't attack people, um, <laughs> towards his eyes and he he laughed. And I didn't realize that this all this background of this, and Mary Selway said, come back tomorrow and read some more with other actors. And this went on for two torturous weeks. I had made the assumption that the actor that had got the role was sunning himself in Florida. <laughs> and I was just reading in, and then I realized that I wasn't. Bruce Robinson was very determined because the I character is Bruce Robinson. He wanted him to sound London in his accent. And Paul was struggling with that. And he then uncast Paul and cast an actor called Michael Maloney. And we then were... Once we'd both been told after lunch that we'd been cast, we went down the subway um, in Notting Hill Gate, and he went to a payphone, which existed in those days, it was pre-mobile phones, and I heard him say, I don't want to do this because I think it's anti-Irish, it's anti-black, and it's homophobic. And I went, what the fuck, you can't do this because we spent two weeks trying to get this thing cast, and it has to be the chemistry between two people. This is my only chance. I will now not be in the movie. And he, well, that's the way I feel. Um... And then Paul was called back the next day. So I then went back and had this sort of gruesome experience of having got the part and then Paul having to sort of fan dance his way to get the part. Anyway, it all worked out. So, you know, it's a long anecdote to that short question. <laughs> and how much rehearsal? Uh, we had two weeks uh, because Bruce was very determined that we, that not a single comma was improvised. Every single thing was as he wanted to hear it in the script and that... Nothing was played for comedy value. It had to be played for the desperation and the situation that they really find themselves in. And he was also determined that, um, he said, you look very fat, Grant. And uh, he said, you've got to lose 12 pounds before we start shooting. So I'd spent a year by, in my unemployment trying to put on weight with weight gain powder and going to the gym and doing all this stuff because I'd read in a magazine, as you do when you're desperate. Um, if you're six foot two uh, and an ectomorph or endomorph, whatever it is, you should weigh 12 stone, which is 160 pounds or whatever. And I was you know, 12, 14 pounds under that. So I then did this weight gain powder. And because I'd worked with Gary Oldman, who'd just done Sid and Nancy, I said, Gary, how the fuck do I get this weight off now? And he said, oh, this is what you do. This is the weight off powder. And it came off in one week. <laughs> so... So that's, that's really how that happened. And he also was, he's a sadist, Bruce Robinson, because he, he said, he came with this pretentious thing. He said, you have to have a chemical memory of what it's like to be completely drunk. And I said, I don't need that. I, I know, I've been around drunks. And he said, no, you have to go home tonight. And I told him I was allergic. He said, you've got to get through this bottle of champagne and come in tomorrow still drunk. So I did. And uh, I managed half an hour of the script at the end of the rehearsals because I knew it, knew at that point. And then there was just this moment where you know you've got to get outside a door because a Persian carpet was coming out my throat. Right. And then I passed out and woke up in my bed at home 24 hours later having blacked out. So the bastard could have killed me. Anyway, I have the chemical memory of what it is to be drunk right. and he believes <laughs> that's the reason why I did this part. He's a lying fuck, but you know. <laughs> and we're great friends. How is working with Richard Griffiths? Absolutely he's sublime. Amazing in this. Absolutely sublime. And I was doing, I was here doing Girls, which I got as a result of being in Spice World, the movie. I kid you not. <laughs> Lena Dunham knew me from that, not from this movie. And she, and he died when I was here. And I was so heart sore not to be at his memorial. So I sent a wreath of vegetables because of, because of Uncle Monty. Um, he was extraordinary because he, he turned up in uh, Cumbria and Penrith where we were shooting and we'd, Paul and I had been already shooting for a week and had rehearsed so we knew every line and comma and full stop and Richard didn't know his lines terribly well and the first scene that we did was an eating scene where I'm not supposed to have eaten for three days and he's very loquacious, he was very loquacious by nature and a great storyteller and I got through three legs of lamb I don't know, four kilos of roast potatoes and eventually they had to have a sick bucket because I was eating so much at such speed and then having to make room by throwing it up because Richard kept fucking up his lines. 
and there were sheep grazing on the mountainside. So since then, 1986, the summer of, I've never eaten lamb since. So that was my introduction to, to Richard. Mm-hmm. You were supposed to be losing weight at this time, not gaining it. Yes, yeah. Um, I think we, we should open it up to some audience questions. Okay. Hi, I'm Stephanie. Hi, oh. Stephanie. I'm Richard. Hi. I'm a member of the cult, uh, which I didn't realize I was a member of a cult. Um, but I have to... Uh, this the cult ex- of Scientology? No. <laughs> the, the cult of Withnal and I. Okay. Um, but I was really struck... I was very emotional this time. I saw this when I was 23, when wow. it came out. And, um, but I, one of the things uh, that was really important to me when I first saw it was, it was the first film I saw um, where I felt like I was seeing a real uh, relationship and friendship between two men with all, you know, all the alcoholism and everything, but the drama, the enmeshment. And, it, um, and I was just wondering, like, I mean, you've s- explained a lot about what the experience was like with uh, Mr. Robinson, and I know it's his script, but what was it like to have that relationship with Paul McGann um, unfold in, on screen, and have you had relationships like that with men? I got on really well with Paul, um, although he did say to me, uh, because he was he just he was the lead, thank you for your question, he was the lead in a television series for the BBC called The Monocled Mutineer. So he was on the cover of magazines while we were shooting this movie. And I think he's about five foot nine or ten, and he said to me, he looked up at me one day and he said, you know, you're never going to make it in the movies because there's nobody who's tall who's ever been a movie actor. And I said, Clint Eastwood, Donald Sutherland, what the fuck? Anyway, so... Uh, but he was, you know, he was competitive in that way about about that. Have I had? I'm very loyal by nature, and somebody called Jonathan Cullen that I was friends with from the age of three in Swaziland. I had lunch with him because he now lives in Los Angeles. I had lunch with him last week. So that is a three from sixty-two is how many? Fifty-nine year friendship. So I have long-term male friendships in my life. If, if that's what you're asking, thank you, Richard. Uh, What's your Mi- name? Uh, Michael, from, Hi, from, Michael from Dublin, Ireland. Um, despite from, the, Ireland? from Dublin, Ireland. Dublin, yes, Ireland. Yes. Hello. Um, despite the success you've had with 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 Neil and I, um, are there any times that you see it as a burden? And are there? Would you ever? Do you ever think that? Do you ever regret making the movie? Thank you for that shameful question. Um, <laughs> I was in a movie called Hudson Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> They're obviously on drugs. Those people. Uh, in 1990, that was began so well because it was going to be uh, directed by Michael Lehman, who just had great success with an indie movie called Heather's with uh, Christian Slater and Winona Ryder. And Dan Waters had written the script, and we thought this is going to be a great adventure. And Bruce Willis was riding high on Die Hard 2 at this point in time, but we didn't realize that the hubris of um, the powers that be overtook Michael's direction. So it was direction by committee and the whole thing went you know, completely AWOL. And the good thing that has come out of it, I was also nominated for a Raspberry Award and didn't win that. My one time to get nominated is for a fucking Raspberry. Um, worst performance of the year. Is that I've stayed great friends with the person that I was husband and wife with, Sandra Bernhardt, who lives in New York City. So that was the bonus. But thank you for lowering the tone about that. Hi, um, this is a deep cut. My name's Chas. Um, but I actually found you through a movie called Jack and Sarah. Uh, I went to Blockbuster as a teenager and thought it was a rom-com. It's not. Um, <laughs> but I enjoyed it. I also loved you in Scarlet Pimpernel. So um, I guess my question is, you're so multifaceted. Um, you've done so many things. What's next for you? I could see like highbrow rom-com, villain. Like I'm super curious what, I mean, I'm not offering you a job, but. <laughs> Regrettably. Thank you. Uh, I'm in the final episode of something called Star Wars. So that's what I'm doing. So that's what that's that's the next thing that I have coming out. And if they don't cut me out of the movie, which is always a possibility. <laughs> but thank you for that endorsement. You can't say who you're playing. No, because uh, I value my knees and... Um, <clears throat> Can you I tell us? I haven't, because you can say, I overshare. Somebody uh, described me as this in an interview last week, so I'm repeating what I've now learned from the media. Um, and 
I was told <laughs> by the producers, they said, it's best if you don't even tell your wife or your daughter wow. what character you're playing. And I've, I've, I've honored that. Can even you though my wife has said, I've never seen Star Wars and I'm never going to see Star Wars. <laughs> I haven't told her because the chances are she could tell somebody in a supermarket, oh, yes, he's playing. And then I'd be done for. Thank you so much. This is my first time seeing the film and it, it's, uh, I'm still processing. Um, Thinking about uh, the incredibly kind and, and uh, just beautiful performance uh, in Can You Ever Forgive Me of, of this uh, gay gentleman in New York in the early 90s, do you think about the Uncle Monty character and the, the uh, gay storyline within Withnil? Does it seem different with 30 years difference? Does it register differently to you? How does it seem to you? Yeah, I love the film. Oh, thank you. Um, how to answer that? I think that's barely a question. I, no, I think that, you know, I think the fact that 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 you know Jack Hawk was completely promiscuous, and as she says, you know, it'll be in our tombstone. He fucked his way around through Manha around Manhattan. Um, that she was a lesbian woman who only found true love in in animals, in in her cats. Um, you know, there's there's great poignancy in the fact that even though homosexuality was legalized in England, I don't know when it ha when it happened here in 1967, and this is set in 1969, um, that that Monty was of the age where he couldn't have come out because he would have been put in jail. That is, you know, incredibly poignant. And uh, you know, on the one on the one hand, you know, when he says, "I mean to have you, even if it means burglary." Um, there's something so sweet about him and that he honors the fact that his nephew, he mistakenly hears uh, the I character saying, you know, we're, we're in a relationship. That's why you can't come. That's why you can't fuck me because I'm involved with your nephew. Um, I don't know if that's answering your question. I've never been asked this question before. What might look like a kind of Hollywood gay panic sort of story. I think there is a, a kindness here that that is is very sweet to see. Yeah, good. Thank you. As you know, um, your character is uh, loosely inspired by Bruce Robinson's friend, Viv. And I was wondering what you can tell us about Viv. Viv McCarroll was an actor who you can see his uh, photo online if you look up Vivian McCarroll. And he was at the Central School of Speech and Drama with Bruce Robinson in the mid-60s. And he, I think he had two jobs playing uh, supporting roles in like D feature movies um, and then never worked again. He, you know, suffered from acute alcoholism. He even had a voice, he had throat cancer as well. So he was putting a cigarette in the hole in his throat and would pour whiskey down the tube going into his stomach the last time Bruce saw him in a hospice. And he died at the age of uh, 49, never having any success, but having this scabrous wit and charm. I never met him because I was ready working the first film I ever did was uh, was shooting here in Boston in 1987 when this came out and Bruce refused to let me meet Vivian because he said it's not going to help you because not a single line is anything that Vivian said but I was just I so wanted to meet Vivian McCarroll because everybody talked about him um, but apparently he did come to the the premiere in London of it and was very pleased with what he saw so that's as much as I can tell you about him. In 1986, when we made this movie, Crocodile Dundee was the global big thing. <laughs> you know, go figure. Um, so our movie had no car chases, no crocodiles, no Australians, no women who were under the age of, you know, 970. Um, an unpronounceable title, no plot, and nobody that anybody had ever seen in a movie before. So, you know, basically, the, the producer, Dennis O'Brien, who was a tax dodger and apparently he's now floating around Hawaii or somewhere. They never caught him. He still owes George Harrison money. Um, he said, this is not funny and it's never going to work. Nobody's going to go and see this. So, sorry, my accent is terrible. But, um, so that was the prevailing thing about it. That, you know, it was unreleasable and nobody would go. So, fuck him. Thank you, Richard, so much for uh, for appearing here today. Um, Thank you. My name's Chris. Hi, uh, Chris. Big fan of the film um, and and your career in general. I just wanted to ask, you know, um, do you have I no socks on? 
Sorry? I do. No, they're, they're just uh, stuffed into my, my boots. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> wow. You're like real tough. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Chris, please. I, I have, a, I, I guess, a two-point two question. Um, the, the, first, the first part is, um, at what point did you realize that uh, the, the Withnal role was a, you know, a role for, for all time in cinema, which I think we can all, you know, agree with here? Um, and the second part, which is related, of course, is, is um, how have you, uh, if you have, kind of conquered this role that, you know, began your career on the screen? Um, and uh, what has that taken? You know, and when I say that, I mean in the kind of, you know, Harold Bloom way of like, you know, the anxiety of influence. You know, you have, you have an unusual uh, situation, as was pointed out at the beginning of this, uh, this question and answer session of uh, having, you know, done an iconic role at the very beginning of your cinematic career. Um, you know, how, how have you dealt with that? Um, how have you been able to sort of overcome the uh, expectation that has, uh, you know, been promised from, from that role? Uh, I, I'm thank you. I'm, I'm grateful that I haven't only been asked to play drug addicted alcoholics for the interim thirty years. Um, the irony is that I played an out of work actor, and it has led to almost without exception every single job and every direct I've I've worked with since. So that has been a great advantage. What I didn't s stick out for, and other actors have said this to me. They said, well, "Why don't you just try and only play leading roles?" Because I went with what the choices that I was given and the the things that were the most interesting or the best directors that I could work with and almost without exception they were supporting roles and have continued to be because you know I know what I look like and I'm essentially a character actor so I know that I don't look like Brad Pitt so I think that has really enormously influenced uh, how my career has gone and for which I'm very very grateful because it's been a kind of slow burn and it was only when the 30th anniversary screenings were held around England uh, two years ago that I, I really I met people and being in a room like this where you go there are people that feel very passionately and strongly about this movie because otherwise you know in your day to day life I, I'm thinking of, you know what's the next thing I'm doing I don't look back so I hope that's answered your question thank you are you surprised by that astonished yeah absolutely so astonished. you never thought about this oh god then. no no absolutely not neither right and when we were making the movie for 26 days with the Mil melissa mccarthy and manhattan this time last year uh it never crossed our minds that we might be up for awards a right. year later i read that um in 2011 Time Out said it was the 15th best film ever oh and in 2017 it's uh, Time Out said it's the seventh greatest comedy ever right and in 2025 it'll be what Right, no. So, I you know, I understand so. that these things change. I mean, yeah. the irony, you talk about critics, that when this movie came out in 1987, the British critics were fair to middling, and, you know, some of them dismissed it. It played for about four weeks in a few cinemas, movie houses. And then when it was re-released, I think 10 or 15 years later, in a much wider number of screens, those same reviewers re-reviewed it and said, oh, it's, it's improved with time. And you go... <laughs> It hasn't. Not a frame of it has changed. So I thought, well, they did this to Kubrick's 2001 as well. That was dismissed, you know, across the board. And then it was re reevaluated as the masterpiece that it is. So, you know, it's all opinion. Well, it's, it's slapstick and it's farce, but it's incredibly sophisticated. And I think it takes time for, for, for us to see great, sophisticated writing when you're fighting off a bull, you know. Okay. Or shooting at, you know, fish. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lily. Thank you so much for being here. I adore this movie. And Hi, I adore Lily. it because it's such a decadent mess. And I feel like we live in this seamless society where, like, I long to see a dish full of sink. You know, uh, you get what I'm saying here, We right? understand. <laughs> we get it. Um, and there's that wonderful t point at the end with the revolving globe and the Hare Krishna I just was wondering for, for a little reflection from you on this passing time they talk about and the sellout of I, you know, joining the army of movie men, perhaps. Like, what is your emotional take of um, what they're losing at the end? 
more than anything, and it's exactly the same, there's the denominator with Can You Ever Forgive Me, is that you're seeing the dissolution of a friendship, even though it's set at the end of an era, I essentially in both movies. But what you've got is that one person is taking responsibility to join the corporate, as you, as you have identified, adult world. And even though Withnell is 29 years old and you know, past his sell-by date, there's, there's just that feeling that he, he's part of the kind of flotsam and jetsam of somebody who is not willing to play the game or to get a job or do all the, th the things that you know, make us responsible, so-called human beings. He's reckless. And so I think that there's... You know, they're very charismatic, those people, because I've known them in my life. But whether I would want to lend them my keys to my apartment or lend them money, I probably wouldn't. But, you know, I, I love it that they're there and they're still here. So I think that that's... But I, I hear what you're saying. I'm very grateful for your question. Thank they you. They certainly make good heroes in movies. Yes, they do. Thank you. Let's do one more question. And I saw Ali's so no pressure. hand... This is like one of these sort of drug meetings. Hi, my name is Ali. <laughs> so my question uh, is actually, uh, what, can you comment a little bit about the role that George Harrison played and what role, if any, Ringo Starr played to get a, a credit, an end credit there? George Harrison wanted uh, a movie company and he wanted it to be quintessentially British movies that were small scale, you know, not huge budget things. And all the Monty Python films were made by his company. And he made a whole lot of these, these Mona Lisa and uh, you probably know the names better than I would because I, my brain is adult here. But uh, he believed in the script and wanted the thing to get made. So he never had any, he didn't involve, he wasn't involved in the editing at all. He just said, I believe in this and you should go ahead and make it. So he and Ringo, came to visit the set one day and that was an amazing thing and especially for Paul McGann because he's a Liverpudlian and these you know the most famous famous men from Liverpool of all time so that was that was an amazing day to see them and so we, we all had it was pre mobile phone and selfies because mobile phones were sort of like that at that point and only billionaires had them we have Polaroids so I've got Polaroids of, of all this that I now put under glass because I'm terrified that they'll you know just disappear and I've taken pictures of them so I've got the digital version version of them, but you know that was a very sweet day to to have those guys come because the first album that I bought when I was ten years old in 1967 was uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So to actually meet these guys who are like, hey, hey, Rich, how you doing? All that it was <laughs> it was just a very very sweet punctuation, and because it was set at the end of the 60s as well, it was it was very sweet. Listen, thank you so much for coming and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for listening to Film Forum Presents. Special thanks to Fox Searchlight, Arrow Films, and Janus Films for making this event possible. If you like what you just heard, please be sure to subscribe to get future episodes and rate and review so that more movie lovers can find us. Film Forum is an independent non-profit cinema and our doors have been kept open for nearly 50 years thanks to the invaluable support of our members and donors. Please visit www.filmforum.org for details on membership, as well as information and showtimes for our current programming. See you at the movies.